In this video, we're going to look into how we can replace the freed kernismen with data we control before we trigger the use after free and we can abuse it. So we mentioned that using the name pipe, it gives us data control and it's technically true and you almost control all of the data. So the question is, is one name pipe allocation all we need to reallocate one chunk and replace our freed K announcement? And it turns out there is technically another problem, which is that when we free the kernel instruments, the kernel is still doing other stuff. And so it may be freeing other chunks. And so there may be other free chunks that will be used instead when we provide an allocation in hopes of filling the chunk that will be used as a free. And you don't know for sure if that happened. So when you're triggering a bug like this, actually, you don't just allocate one fake k enlistment and hope it fills the hole. You kind of spray a bunch and how many is just based on kind of trial and error. And you're trying to deal with the case that maybe the kernel just freed some other memory and your fake k enlistment will go into those extra holes rather than the hole you want. So the solution is to spray like 10 fake k enlistments every time we think we won the race. And in practice, it's enough. So I have a small animation to show what happens now. So if we go back to the layout we want, we just spray k enlistments that become adjacent. So let's say this k enlistment is the one that is going to be used after freed. So it is first freed. And now we allocate a new chunk as we try to reallocate into that slot. But oh, it is still free. We don't know where our allocation occurred, but it definitely didn't occur where we wanted. And so if we do it 10 times, then the idea is that the hole will eventually be taken by one of our 10 allocations. And we finally get what we wanted, which is that the allocation happens in our previously freed Kernismant. So now it's probably a good time to revisit the end goal, which is that using the name pipe right, we want to introduce a fake k enlistment that will have a controlled flink pointer. So we need to understand what data we control or do not control in the replacement chunk. Basically, you do control most of the data in the name pipe, except a small header in front of it, but you also need to take into account the layout of the or original k enlistment since it has its own header structures too, due to being tracked by the object manager. One thing about writing data into a name pipe is that it isn't tracked by the object manager. So there is a, a structure in front of the data that you write to the name pipe called data entry, and then immediately adjacent to it is the data you control. Whereas in the case of the k enlistment, because it's an actual object, like a kernel object, it's managed by the object manager. And so when you allocate it on the heap, it has a header, which is used for tracking process quota information. Then it has the actual object header. And finally, it has the actual k enlistment. So you have to figure out this memory layout for both the k enlistment and for the pipes data. So you are able to work out the actual offsets in the name pipe data that you supply. So it correlates to the actual flink pointer in the k enlistment chunk. And the same for basically other fields in the k enlistment structure. So just a small animation to show the actual k enlistment chunk in memory. And so what we did is we dumped the address that is returned from the pool allocation and we dumped the different structures that are part of that chunk. And so we first dump the pool header and you can see that the contents are relatively same by checking the sizes and the pool tag and whatnot. And then we can see that there is an object header quota info, which just tracks the process associated with the allocation. And then we see the actual object header, which the object manager uses to track reference counting and stuff. And then the actual k enlistment with valid fields like the cookie or the various pointers. And so this just confirms that our understanding of what is being placed in memory is correct. And basically it is either other people have documented it or you know that the object manager will always create an object header. And you look at the flags that are passed 
to those APIs to understand whether or not an additional header, like the object header quota info structure, will be present, or you figure it out manually in the debugger. And yes, that often just takes a lot of trial and error in WinBag until things actually match. Similarly here with the data entry structure that is part of the name pipe write allocation. So the data entry structure itself is not documented by Microsoft, but React OS has their own implementation, which seems to be correct. They just don't call it data entry and instead they call it NP data queue entry. So finding it just meant like finding the name pipe code in React OS. Then at the bottom, there is this WinBag output and we can see there is a, a pool header, there is the data entry structure. And then at the rightmost column of the fourth line, we start to have control data. 0, 0, 0, 001, 0, 02, 0, 03, 0, 04, 0, 05, 0, 06, 0, 07, and so on. And so when you use incrementing values for control data like this, you can work out which value is actually being queried in a use after free case. And you can figure out the exact offset inside of the data you control to replace with the data you want or whatever. So for a lot of the pool functionality, the algorithms and techniques for spraying in general and things like the delayed free are fairly well documented. The main thing is that a lot of these papers go really, really deep on lots of different internals. And the main thing with papers like this sometimes to realize is like, aside from the delayed free logic, you don't really need to know that much about how the algorithm of the non-page pool really works. There is the delayed free thing, sure. There is the fact that the pool tags exist at all that lets you identify things when analyzing memory with bank pool command. And then, there is the idea of chunk coalescing, which almost all heaps use anyways. So if you're familiar with most heaps, it's okay to like assume that that type of coalescing will probably occur. But the thing is, if you read some of these papers, like that Targement one from Black Hat 2011, it goes into way more details than you actually need. And it's just a word of caution, I guess, which is that if you read a paper like this, you might think that doing stuff on a kernel pool is really complicated and you need to know all of this information. But actually, really, the approach is usually just bare bones information enough to get by and move on to the next step and only really start digging into things if you have to.